All right, hello once again, Jeff Scott of Rankin Technical College. And as prep work for the Rankin Technical College AWD 1000 Web Development Technologies and mainly for this series of presentations, the AWD 1111 Database Driven Web Development, I'm going through a series of video presentations that I'm basing off of some of the eBooks by Mr. Flavio Copes. And I've done four or five so far and I'm in the Node.js one right now. So I'm just going to continue on the usual way to run a node program is to call the node globally available command and pass it the name of the file. Now, when you do this, you've got your choice. You can type in node app.js or you can just type in node app without the .js because it defaults to a JavaScript file. So they will both do the same thing. Not that that's a big thing, but just so you hear it. <clears throat> when you want to get out of a node program, you do a control C and you may or may not have noticed I did that before. Now, there's also a way that right in your code, you can put in process.exit, but they mention in here, it, it's basically you're forcing a break to happen. And as it says, it means that anything that's pending is just going to go away. And that's a very ungraceful way to terminate. So you really shouldn't do that. <clears throat> but if you are, Typically, you put a number in there that signals, uh, gives a signal to the operating system. It's an exit code. If you put zero in there, typically that means success. And there's other numbers that you can you can uh, look up and they're right here if you're interested. <clears throat> you can also set the exit code in code. <clears throat> As it says here, many times with Node, we start servers like this HTTP server. Now, this is similar to what we did last time. It's not the same thing. This is adding Express, which, again, we'll talk about later on. But uh, it's also saying that when we do a GET request, which just basically means, in this case, when we were to, if we were to bring up, like, localhost 3000, it's just going to send the word, the word hi back. All right. And this will actually show... Now, the console here, it's kind of important that you realize that when we're talking about the console here, we're talking about this console right in here. So, again, when we put in, and I typed in node, and we put in server.js, as I mentioned, you can just say server. Now, there's a message that's going on the server right there. It says server running, but it's showing the console for server operations. That's as opposed to if we were to, for example, um, come in and do an inspect and come in here and go to the console. This is the console on the client side. <clears throat> there is a big difference between those. Okay. All right, so they go through a bunch of stuff and ways that you can you can close, etc. I'm not going to run through this now because I don't typically do it this way. All right, <clears throat> let's jump into how to read environment variables. As it says here, the process core module of Node provides the ENV property, which hosts all the environment variables that were set at the moment the process was started. It says, here's an example that accesses the node ENV environment variable set to development by default. So, as it says, by default, this is set to development. What, what does that mean? That means that you're in a testing mode. That means that your application is not yet finished. If you go in and you set it to production mode, you are then changing the environment from a development environment to a production environment. Typically, you put something into a production environment when you are ready to take what you're working on. And in our case, we're going to be using Heroku. And we're going to be using a combination, really, of Heroku and GitHub. And uh, we are going to be putting that right out onto the internet for usage. You can also 
access any custom environment variable you've set or that exists out there. Okay. All right. It says a node.js application can be hosted in a lot of different places. That's true, depending on your needs. And they give a list of some. Now, the only one in here that we care about is Heroku. All right. And notice as it says, it's an amazing platform. There's a great article here on it. And I don't know. This is one from the Heroku. I believe this is from Heroku itself on how to use it. All right. We're not going to jump into that right now. It's the old saying that we have to learn to crawl before we can learn to walk, before we can learn to run. All right. But what they give in here is they give a lot of different examples of the different things that can be used. Glitch, code pen, serverless. And to me, serverless is kind of a misnomer. All right. It says it's where you publish your apps as functions and they respond to a network endpoint. There still is some server code involved. Platform as a service. Heroku is the one that we care about. You can also use things like Microsoft Azure and the Google Cloud, rather. All right. So that said, I'm going to jump into REPL. REPL, as it says, stands for Read, Evaluate, Print, Loop. Now, what they say in here is it's a great way to explore some of the node features in a quick way. All right, we've already used this node command. And you saw what happened when we did this. In other words, we came in here. This is running. So if we do come out and we get it and open up a browser window and come in here and again say HTTP colon slash slash localhost colon 3000 it should give us our old hello world and it does all right no biggie right there but i'm going to stop this and i'm going to come in here and i'm going to do a control c to stop this and i'm going to clear now i'm just going to type in node and hit enter now i am in repl all right and it's a lot like being in the console when you're in the console on the on the client side. In other words, I can type in here 2 plus 2, and it shows me 4. I can create a variable. Let f name equal Jeff. It comes back undefined because I have not returned anything. But now if I type in f name, notice it says Jeff. All right. So I can come in here and say let num1 equal 37 let num2 equal 48 let product equal num1 times num2 and now i can so show product now i'm not it, you know if i hit enter 1776 okay all right <clears throat> So they do mention in here, and let's go back to this. The command stays in idle mode and waits for you to enter something. All right. It says you can start it, you can enter console.log test, and it'll show the word test. Fine. Okay. And again, that undefined just means that nothing is being returned from this. Okay. Now, they mention here the cool thing, so to speak, about REPL is it's interactive. As you write your code and you hit tab or you hit enter, it'll try to do some autocomplete for you. All right. It says try entering the name of a JavaScript class like number at a dot and press tab. So let's try that. So it says number dot hit tab. And what you get shown here then are all the different things that you can use. All right. With a number class. You could expect inspect rather it says the globals you have access to by typing global dot. And 
hitting the tab key. Of course, you have to spell it correctly. And there they are. Same ones that are shown here. So these are all things that you have access to. It says, if after some code you type an underscore, that is going to print the results of the last operation. So let's try that. So if I do an underscore... 1776, what is that? That's that last multiplication that I put in there. All right. So there's some special commands probably in here. The ones that you're going to care about the most will be the dot help because that shows you different things. Now, notice if I want to get out of REPL, one way that I can get out is I can use dot exit and that'll exit REPL or I can use the control C. Sometimes as it says you get stuck okay and you can use the dot break to try to get you out. Dot break and dot clear work the same way. If you want to make sure you're in editor mode you can put in dot editor. The help gave you this. The load as it says will load JavaScript from a file into a REPL session talk about that in a bit and if you want to be able to save your REPL session to a file you can use the dot save all right <clears throat> it says the REPL knows when you are typing a multi-line statement without the need to invoke the editor so when you just start working with it it kind of can figure out what you're doing or at least will take a well-educated guess all right Okay, I think that's just about it for talking about REPL. So what I'm going to do is, again, I can come in here and notice I can put in dot break and hit enter. Or I can do a control C. And as it says, if I want to exit, do another control C. And now I'm out of REPL. Now, just so you know, REPL is... I guess it's a nice feature to have, but it's probably at least something you're rarely, if ever, going to use. All right, that's not a warning or anything. It's just pretty much the truth. It's probably not something that you're going to use very often, at least. <clears throat> now, next they talk about passing in arguments from the command line. And as it says, you can pass in any number of arguments when invoking a node.js app using this <clears throat> now remember if you just say node it puts you into REPL if you say node followed by app.js it attempts to run the app.js file in the example here you're running it but you're passing in an argument that argument is Flavio and here, doing it like this, you could say name equal, meaning it's a named argument. All right. Now, it says what this does is it exposes what's called an argv property. And that's also known as an argument vector. It's an array that contains everything that you've added as a command line argument. As it says, the first argument is the full path of the node command. The second element is the full path of the file being executed and any additional arguments. So that would be the third one. You can iterate over all of your arguments by doing this. You probably won't have a reason to use a lot of this stuff most of the time, at least. So they show an example here. And as it says, if you have one argument without an index name like like is shown, you can access it this way. So doing that will give you this. All 
I'm at 15. I think I'm going to go on here because there's a lot of the stuff that's in here that you're probably not going to use real often. All right. So how to print to the command line console using Node and some other scenarios. And as it says there, Node provides a console module which provides tons of very useful ways to interact with the command line. All right. So if we said this, as mentioned there, Node will print both. In other words, X and Y. You can also, for lack of better words, kind of pretty print. This percent %S is a placeholder, which will be used for cat, meaning it's going to be a string. This percent %D actually stands for decimal integer, and it's got the two. So it will say my cat has two years. All right. There's also percent %F for floating point, which handles numbers that can have a decimal place. All right. And a percent %O for object representation. All right. Console.clear can be used, as it says, to clear the console. I never even tried that here. Let's see. Can we do that? And it is a method. Nope. Didn't like that. Or that but it does take that now I'm not technically I'm in git bash which is probably why that's happening all right but let's see if I just go into node all right if I come in here and type in console dot clear okay it does I guess it cleared the console Console.count, all right. Now, this is running some regular JavaScript, so oranges, notice it's going to do a count of how many oranges you had and how many apples you had. I, I don't really care about most of this stuff. Stack trace can be important. What a stack trace is, is imagine you've got a program that's got function one that calls function two that calls function three. All right. And there's a problem with function three. If you do a stack trace, it'll show you on function three where that problem was, and it'll show you where it was called in function two. Then it'll show you where that was called in function one. All right. And that's what the stack is. And you, when you rewind it, basically, it shows you from your latest to your earliest function call invocations. There's a time and a time end. I've never used either one of these. Standard out and standard error are interesting. All right. As it says, as we saw, the console log is great for printing messages to the console. This is what's called the standard output or standard out. There's also an error stream. Now, you may or may not be aware of this, but for example, if I go back in here, let me go back to here, and I'm just going to come in here. And I'm going to go to inspect, and I'm going to go to my console right here. All right. Now, can I do a console.clear here? I believe I can. There we go. Now, if I say console.log, and I say hello world, I get hello world. No biggie there. But if I do it again, and I change that from console.log to console.error you might say what's the big deal well it is a big deal because this is just printing regular this is printing this basically as an error all right so when they show that in here standard error that's kind of where we're sending things all right so if you it, a lot of times what you'll do is if, if something goes wrong in a program Rather than logging it, you might want to write it out to error so that somebody can take a look for it through it later. Okay. You can color the output of your text, as it says, by using escape sequences. I've never done that before. I guess you can. You can create progress bars. Just makes things a little bit easier to take a look at. All right. Now, next day talk here. In fact, I think I'm going to stop it right here. Yeah, I'm at 20 minutes, so I'll... Pick it up here in the next lecture.